the vision of modern Judaism, to begin with what we have in our notes, the vision for modern Messianic Judaism is to see Jewish identity authentically lived down in the body of Messiah. That's the vision. That's how this whole movement started. You see, the movement started with uh, Jewish believers being denied their, their right to continue to be to, to live a Jewish life. So they were called Hebrew Christians. And their understanding, because of what they were taught as they came into the church, was that their Jewishness was of no value anymore. It meant nothing. Every, everyone, you know, there is no Jew or Greek in Messiah. So they interpreted that as there is no Jew. <laughs> um, and God was going to deal with the Jews in the future again, but as of now, if you are a Jew and you are in a church, in this church dispensation, then that means nothing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the Jewish, the, the Messianic movement is a no to that theology mm-hmm. and the understanding that we can live as Jews. We can live. We can be believers in Yeshua and still be Jews. So living out Jewish identity in the body of Messiah is preserving Jewishness uh, instead of uh, letting go of it, watering it down as members of the body of Messiah. So the idea is then to preserve Jewishness in the body of Messiah. Now, uh, that means Jews living as Jews, even though, even as believers in Yeshua. That nothing makes you more Jewish than believing in the Jewish Messiah. Amen. It's, uh, <laughs> it's so crazy to have to even say that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, now, Here's, a, here's where the liturgy comes in, and this is going to be kind of a, a, my burden of proof, okay? I take it on myself because I'm going to show that the statement that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make right now, I'm going to, we're going to see the validity of it. And it is that the use of Jewish liturgy in worship is about as authentically Jewish as can be. So if the goal is to live a Jewish life in the body of Messiah, few things help you more than doing Jewish liturgy. That's my thesis. That in order to to live a Jewish life corporately, liturgy gets you a long way into it. If you want to have a, a congregation, if we want to have a congregation uh, in which Jewish life is lived out, not only by Jews, but by the com- as a community, being a Messianic congregation made of Jews and non-Jews, but as a community, we want to live the covenant that God made with Israel um, because we believe that that's how that's what the faith was supposed to be originally you know we just saw we studied about Cornelius this morning even before he came to know Yeshua the spirit came upon him he was living he was progressing towards living the faith living out the faith he was praying at the appointed times Um, And God, his prayer were ascending to the throne of God. No amount of uh, Jewish authority contrary to his experience could have override what the angel said to him. The angel himself said, your prayers have ascended. Period. You are accepted as a non-Jew. And it is okay 
This is the right way to live your faith, living it in a Jewish context. So the purpose then of this teaching is to help us understand is three things. To help us understand, we understand with our mind, to help us understand, to help us love. We love with our emotions, with our heart. And to help us practice, right? So we're engaging all of who we are as, as a person. Our intellect, our emotions, and our body. We're doing, we're, we're learning, we're loving, and we're doing Jewish liturgy. The purpose of this teaching is to help us accomplish that. To, to learn, to love, and to practice Jewish liturgy. And we're going to do the, this by studying the historical development, the biblical theology, the structure, and the content of the liturgy. So we're going to divide it in our two weeks. We're going to divide it in two. Uh, today we're going to, we're going to study the, the uh, historical development and the biblical theology. Next week, we're going to take a look at the structure of the liturgy and the content. So we'll get into the, the prayers themselves next week. And today, we're going to see the history and the theology so that we have um, a, the, the biblical basis. Uh, if you're going to love the liturgy, you have to see how biblical it is. Otherwise, you'll still be on the fences. You'll say, well, I don't, I don't know. This is one way. But when you see it for what it is, then you'll just love it because you know it's God's word lived out in, in a practical way. So why Jewish liturgy, though? <clears throat> well, many people in the Messianic movement wonder and have this question, why Jewish liturgy. Why so much Jewish liturgy? Why so much Hebrew? <laughs> now, this isn't Jewish. Jewish people have this question because many Jews grew up, and the and the liturgy, the the synagogue, uh, altogether meant next to nothing. They couldn't wait. Uh, you know, for them to do the bar mitzvah and get out of the synagogue as soon as they could. Most Jews are going to have that testimony. That the last significant religious thing they did was their bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, and then they were out until, you know, their 40s or whatever it is. So the liturgy has no practical meaning for them. So when they come to know the Lord... Now they appreciate the Lord, they appreciate worship, and they do all of these, these things. And when you do liturgy, they're, they're the first one saying, in many cases, why so much Hebrew? Why so much liturgy? I used to do that. It meant nothing. <laughs> On the other side, then, of obviously, people who grew up without any connection to Judaism then have the same question. Why do, I, why do we have to worship in a different language? And, uh, and why so much of it? You know, I understand a little bit, but why so much of it? Well, uh, the question then still remains, why, why do so much of the liturgy in our services? Now, the answer is this. The answer is that the answer is in the connection between Jewish liturgy and Jewish identity. The answer, is, the answer is in the connection between liturgy and covenant faithfulness. Can you live out the covenant? Can you live a Jewish life, authentically Jewish, without the liturgy? Is that possible? My contention is that, no, it is not possible. And we're going to see why. Now, you can see I'm, I'm placing a lot of importance, a lot of weight on the, on the liturgy. Um, and the reason I do this is because I know what I have. 
I know I'm going to satisfy uh, such high uh, expectation. Now, in our Messianic movement uh, of today, as we were talking a little bit, it began as a Hebrew, as Hebrew Christianity. Uh, they were called Hebrew Christians uh, around the 1900s, and it was coming from the 1800s. And it's a great revival. Many, many Jews came to know the Lord. That in itself is a great miracle. But it has been a progress. Uh, what God has been doing in this awakening and this revival uh, of Jewish salvations, it has been progressive because being saved is just the beginning. You have a whole walk and you need to be and do congregational living and, and, um, and you have to deal with practical things. Now, to understand it correctly from a historical perspective, then we, we see that this, um, this evolution of the movement from Hebrew Christianity to Messianic Judaism was a, number one, it was a thorough affirmation that Jewish believers in Messiah could continue to be Jews. Mm -hmm. That it was possible. That you didn't have to deny, leave out, and let die your Jewishness. But the challenge that we face today is different. You see, that was the challenge that they were facing uh, in the 50s and the 60s, and then in the 70s, it, it, it came to fruition. The Messianic movement was born. It, they declared, we can be believers and Jews at the same time. We do not have to deny our Jewishness. But the challenge we have today is different because the movement has continued to evolve. The question and the challenge that we have today is to affirm that Jews must live as Jews. You see the difference? Not only that you can, but that you have a covenant responsibility to remain Jewish. It's not optional. Of course, you can reject the responsibility. But God, it, it, God's ideal is for Jews to continue to live as Jews. Not optional. So whereas the challenge before was can we live as Jews? Now the challenge is we must live as Jews. Let me read to you. Uh, I've been talking and not doing any of this. this is, these are the things we've already talked about. Let me, let me uh, read this quote to you. You have it also on your notes, I, I believe. So this is Rabbi Mark Kinzer, one of the, probably the most influential theologian in the Messianic movement. If you, you may not have heard of him, but you felt the effect of some of the things that he's written because everybody else has had to d uh, deal with the effects in, in a good way. So he said, he wrote this, Messianic Judaism can perform its necessary ecclesiological role, and we're going to break out these big words, Messianic Judaism can fulfill its ecclesiological role only if it is an embodiment of Jewish covenant fidelity at home in the Jewish world. What is he saying? Well, it's saying that that Messianic Judaism has a role a role in the, it's an ecclesiological role. So it's a role in the body of Messiah. They have a role, and they can fulfill that role only if they remain faithful to the covenant, if they live as Jews. 
That's that's an obvious statement. It's not it's not a real uh, super deep statement. But the last phrase where it says, "At home in the Jewish world," at home in the Jewish world, meaning you have to be authentically Jewish in your expression of congregational life. It has to feel like home for a Jew. Only then can you really fulfill your role. So it's not enough to say, well, I'm a believer I'm, and I'm Jewish. That's awesome, fantastic. But it, as a con- where did you congregate? Are you supporting a, 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 uh, com- a community life that seeks to preserve Jewish identity? Are you doing that? Then if, you, if your answer is no, then um, hopefully it's a temporary thing. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I mean in, in a moment. But you should be, as, a, as J- any, any Jewish believer should be walking towards really being a member of a Messianic congregation. That is the way to fulfill the role, their role in, in the body of Messiah. Uh, the reason why I say hopefully that's temporary because I was in a church. I was raising my kids in a church. The Lord had me there for that time. So you, the most important overall is that you have to be following what the Lord is speaking to you. You have to, you have to live by faith. If God tells Abraham, I want you to kill your boy, you better do it. If God tells a Jew, I want you to go to church, don't question that. I'm, I, will not, I will not question that. But I will question, you know, are you sure that you're really hearing the Lord? That's what I would, that's what I would say. You know, ask him. Ask, you know, go, out, go back again. Ask him again, you know. Because I think overall, in general, his desire is for Jews to be in a community where Jewish life can be lived out. That is why we went, as a family, we went seeking, okay, this is, this, this is a time for us to go and come back into living, supporting a community um, that is a Messianic Jewish community. That's why we came here. And the Lord obviously had a plan. And I, and I believe this is, this is a calling uh, a Jew who is at a church should consider the calling. If he has a calling to support Jewish community, um, the congregational community, because more than serving his or her needs, this is a calling that goes above and beyond that. It's a sacrificial calling. Okay, so at home in the Jewish world. Uh, another rabbi, Rabbi uh, Dowerman, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he says that being at home in the Jewish world is directly proportional to increased use of traditional Hebrew liturgy. So what he's saying is, if you want to make a congregation feel like home to a Jew, do liturgy. Now that is another way of saying what we already said at the beginning, that there is a direct connection between covenant faithfulness for a Jew and doing the liturgy. And again, we're making the same statement in a different way, and we're going to show how this has validity. so the question, is there a connection between Jewish, between liturgy and Jewish covenant fidelity? So if, if we answer yes, then liturgy should be taken seriously, not only by Messianic Jews, but also for Gentile members of Messianic congregations who have chosen to live together with their fellow Jewish believers, their covenant commitments. 
So it's not only important for Jews to uphold Hebrew liturgy, but also for non-Jews. The case of Cornelius again. I don't think Cornelius came after he was, uh, belie he believed in Yeshua, received the Holy Spirit, began to congregate with Peter and John and Paul and all of those guys. I don't think he was pushing for, guys, can we do less liturgy? <laughs> <laughs> can we not do so much Hebrew? Let's try some Italian. <laughs> That's where he was from, right? <laughs> Let's eat some pepperoni here. I don't think so. <laughs> you see, I think he had a higher calling. He demonstrated it even before he, he was a believer because it says that his, his giving, his financial support of the Jewish community had ascended to, to the Lord. So he was supporting Jewish congregational and community life as a non-Jew. So I think that's also just as a, uh, I believe that Jews have a, believing Jews have a calling to uphold Jewish community life. I actually believe that non-Jews also have the same calling <laughs> to find to to I believe to uh, if you're if, if a person is finding a, a non-Jew is looking for the Jewish roots, I believe they have come to the, to the center of the roots when they realize I, I have a calling to support Jewish life. Not only for Jews, but because this is, the, this is what the faith was intended to be. Um, and this is a calling from the Lord. And so both together as a congregation seeking to um, fulfill this role in the body of Messiah of preserving Jewish identity in the body of Messiah. This is not only a calling for Jews, but it's a calling for Gentile believers as well to help preserve this identity in the body of Messiah that, that uh, the, the, the body of Messiah has an increasing, ever increasing manifestation of Jewishness because in the end what we're doing is bringing now to the present the vision that the Lord has for the future when when Yeshua comes and he set up set up his office on the temple mount in Jerusalem all the nations will have to come to celebrate the feast I believe most of them will want to come because they, they will have the understanding that this is the faith, Amen. And, and which is what we have come to understand. Amen. So there is a connection between Jewish liturgy and covenant faithfulness, and we're going to continue to work at proving that. So the question then uh, uh, as we begin to, to answer this question to, to is there a connection between Jewish liturgy and covenant fidelity then I want us to look at the beginning of Jewish worship or just worship in general um, and it begins in the Garden of Eden it begins in the Garden of Eden so Genesis 2.15 it says then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. To cultivate it and to keep it. You've heard this. I've heard this. To cultivate. This uh, dignifies work, right? To cultivate it and to keep the garden. Well, no. <laughs> Here's the thing. You don't have to cultivate something that does not have any bugs to kill. It's a garden. There were no bugs to kill. No. Uh, you didn't have to trim any, any uh, branches that were going bad. Um, 
there really was no agricultural work to do other than picking the fruit and putting it in your mouth. There was nothing else. You didn't have to preserve anything, cultivate. There was nothing to do. So what's going on in this verse? You see, the Hebrew verbs here, cultivate and to keep, in the Hebrew are avar and shamar. Avad, I'm sorry, avad and shamar. Avad and shamar. Now, look what it says. If we were to do a literal translation of this, that Adam was put in the garden as a priest to avad and shamar. What is the meaning of that? Well, the Hebrew word avad, avad derives from, uh, from this Hebrew word avad derives the word avodah. Avodah is worship. It is the sacrificial service. Do you have a question, Sophie? That's A B B as in boy A B O D as in David A H Aboda. It's the it's a regular word for worship and specifically for worship with sacrifices, mm-hmm. temple worship. So Moses told Pharaoh, "Let my people go so that they can uh, offer me a feast and serve me in the desert." What was the word there? It was avodah. To serve me in the desert, to bring sacrifices to me, to the, to, to the Lord. So, uh, this is the word, this is one of the biblical words for worship. Now, the Hebrew word shamar, the other word, is a term that is, most, is the most used, uh, frequently used word, translated to keep, to keep the word of God, to guard the commandments, uh, to observe the Torah is the word shamar. So now we have a completely different view of what Adam and Eve, Eve's uh, job in the garden was. They were not there to cultivate, they were there to worship. You see, the word again is avad, which means to serve. If they were there to serve the ground, what were they? Slaves to the ground. You see, that word also can mean slave, avad. That's where they. That's what they were after the fall. Part of Adam's punishment was, now you are going to work the ground, to serve the ground, avat, same word. Same word. It, it, it was an ironic reversal. You were supposed to worship avad, now you're going to serve avad. Same word, but the different meanings of it. But originally, they were supposed to Worship and guard, protect, observe the word of God. They they had a priestly job. That was their job. To worship and obey God's word. So one of my favorite authors, uh, John Salehammer, if you have a, uh, an opportunity, if you ever come across one of his books, um, I recommend him to you. I study some of his stuff uh, uh, for my preparation. He writes uh, on his, uh, in his uh, comment- commentary to Genesis, which I think is probably the best commentary on the book of Genesis. It says, uh, the man is put in the garden to worship God and obey him. The man's life in the garden was to be characterized by worship and obedience. He was to be a priest, not merely a worker and keeper of the garden. He was to be a priest. That is the beginning of worship. 
So the garden's serve, service, worship service, quickly developed the need for sacrificial animals. Remember, Adam and Eve sin. God made them garments out of skins. Where did God get those skins? He sacrificed animals for atonement for their sin. And we know, actually, that it was a whole burnt offering. How do we know? Because Leviticus 7 says that the only sacrifice from which the priest gets to keep the skin of the animal is the burnt offering. Nothing else. So it was a burnt offering. Because the priest, Adam, got to keep the skin. So the, the, there was a need for sacrificial animals that developed quickly in the worship in Scripture. Now, the Bible is clear, however, that sacrifice alone does not please God. Many, many times in the Bible, in Yeshua said this. Now, uh, Hosea 14, verses 1 and 2, is a very interesting verse. It says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity. And receive us graciously, that we may present the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips. That word fruit, we say this word every Shabbat, and we just said it an hour ago. When we say, Boe Pri Hagafen, who creates the fruit of the vine. The fruit, that's the same word, the fruit, Peri. You see, the word for bowl, as in a offering, the word for bull is par. The word for fruit is peri. P-R. You can see P-R are the main uh, consonants there. And you know the Hebrew words with consonants. Same root. So there's a play on words here where it says uh, that we may present the fruit of our lips, that we may present the bulls of our lips. Watch this. You know this next verse. Uh, Hebrews 13, 15. It says, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. So you know he's quoting Hosea. The fruit of lips. And in the Greek, it's the word for fruit. So he didn't even make it uh, um, like ambivalent or, or a play on words. But he took the, uh, the one meaning, the fruit of lips, <coughs> praise and worship. How, what do we learn in this then? Well, we learned that The sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, were only pleasing to God if it was accompanied by, through, by, by true worship. You know, what God really wanted was, he wanted both. He wanted your physical animal sacrifice, but he wanted your worship from the fruit of, the, of lips that worship him. But if you, can, if you don't have a temple in which to offer an animal sacrifice, you can perfectly offer the fruit, the fruit of your lips. Now you can see, you can begin to see how important this truth is for Israel. 
because not too many years after Hosea wrote that, both kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom, were taken from the land, had to live far from the temple, and then the temple was destroyed. So the only option they had was to offer the fruit of their, of the, of their lips. Now, because of a lack of understanding, many theologians criticize Israel, even today, because they have substituted prayer instead of sacrifices. But this just shows a lack of understanding that it is actually a biblical thing to offer praise and prayers instead of sacrifices if you have to. If you don't have the means, if you don't have the temple to offer sacrifices, it is perfectly biblical to offer praise and worship and prayer as the sacrifice. We studied this morning about the times of prayer, the prayers, the, the times of sacrifices, and how it, it goes after, these times go after us dedicating ourselves to him and offering a living sacrifice to him. So the connection between Sacrifice and prayer is evident when David appointed the Levites to lead prayer, praise, music, and blessings in the tabernacle during the times of the sacrifice. So David made it official to accompany sacrifice with prayer and praise. Exactly what Hosea was teaching many years later. So this is something that was, that Israel understood. That the times of prayer, of, of sacrifice, go along with praise and prayer and worship and music. They picked this up when they came back from the exile in Babylon. Because we see that immediately they reinstated the same worship and music and prayer and praise going on when the second temple was, was built. But this may be an indication that during those 70 years in Babylon, they, when, they, when the synagogues were developed, you realize you don't see synagogues until after the Babylonian exile, because the, the synagogues were, were began during the Babylonian exile. So when you see that they reinstituted this type of worship and prayer along with the sacrifices in the second temple, this may be an indication that they were practicing prayer and praise during the times of the sacrifices in those synagogues when they were in Babylon. So that these times of this, this uh, practice that King David started before the, the exile was carried on even in the exile of in, in, in lack of the sacrifices, in lack of the temple, prayer and praise was perfectly okay. It was at least the minimum you could do. So you, you begin to see how the times of sacrifices are tied to the times of prayer and how it is all so rooted in Scripture. Now, David, when he, uh, you notice that in David's Levitical arrangement, 
the connection of prayer and the time of sacrifices. We see that in uh, 1 Chronicles 23.30, which is what we were just mentioning. They are to stand every morning to thank and, and to praise the Lord, and likewise at evening. These are the times of the sacrifices, morning and evening. Verse 31, and to offer all burnt offerings to the Lord on the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the fixed fest festivals in the number set by the ordinance concerning them continually before the Lord. So they are to stand during the sacrifices in the morning to thank and to praise the Lord. This is your worship team in King, King David's worship team during the hours of sacrifice to offer praise and worship, thanksgiving to the Lord. Now, David obviously used some of the psalms uh, during these times of prayers and, uh, and praise and uh, along with the sacrifices. Now, in, in one of the apocryphal books, in the book of Ben Zira, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of these books. These books, you can find these books in the Catholic Bibles. Uh, you can actually read uh, First and Second Maccabees. These are not Catholic books. <laughs> These are very much Jewish books. <laughs> well, this book of Benzira is is one of those. It's one of those books. This this is a, a very thoroughly Jewish book. And um, uh, let me quote a, a, a scholar who is writing this uh, uh, Israeli scholar. His name is um, uh, Bilha Nitzan. He says, in Ben Zira 51, 12, there, there, are, there is a series of blessings of God, some of which are similar to the Amidah prayer of the Jewish liturgy. What am I saying? Well, this book of Ben Zira is way before the time of Yeshua. Okay? And you can already see the themes of the Amidah. Now I'm beginning to use words that you, that you can relate to. You know what the Amidah is. We do the Amidah. Now let me show you how far back this prayer goes. This Benzir is probably uh, 200 years, around 200 years before Yeshua. And you can already see some of the same language that, they, that, they, that we have in the Amidah. It says, you can read this passage of Ben Zira. It says, for you saved me from destruction and rescued me in time of trouble. For this reason, I thank you and praise you, and I bless the name of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of praises, for his mercy, in, mercy endures forever. I underlined for you the phrases that I want us to, uh, to look at. Did I underline it for you or not? Okay, we're going to see it underlined on the screen. Uh, give thanks to him who formed all things. For his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Redeemer of Israel. This is, this is uh, uh, the first phrase that we see that we find in the Amidah. The Redeemer of Israel. And you may say, well, that's a coincidence. Well, probably. But if you have five or, or six of these same phrases, hmm, you may have something. It says, for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to him who gathers the dispersed of Israel. Another phrase from the Amidah. For his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to him who rebuilt his city and his sanctuary. The Amidah right there. For his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to him who makes a horn to sprout for the house of David. For his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to him who has chosen the sons of Zadok to be priests. For his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the shield of Abraham. Have you ever heard that one? The shield of Abraham. Yeah. 
The Amidah. We say it every Shabbat. The Amidah is the standing prayer. That's what the word Amidah means. Or is the Shemone Esre, which means the 18 benediction, which is really 19 because they added one. Um, but this is the prayer. The prayer. Uh, some of the things that you say before are preparatory for the Amidah, and some of the things that you say after are kind of putting an, a, 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 an end point to the Amidah. The focus is the Amidah. Now, what we see here is the beginnings of, of, of set prayers, of prayers that are written in our are said word for word, just like what we do. We continue on in this, this development. We, we, I think we, we've moved from the theological background, now we're seeing a little bit of a, the historical background of the liturgy. Now we're beginning to see where the main prayer came from. Watch the next uh, uh, step here. The earliest witness of fixed prayer, uh, a Jewish liturgy, we find it in uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there is one scroll which is called 4Q 503 Daily Prayers. You say, like, what is that? <laughs> okay, this means that they found it on the fourth cave, 4Q. So there were several caves, and there were hundreds of fragments. Some were big, you know, like a whole scroll, the scroll of Isaiah. Some were just little pieces that, that's why it has taken years to decipher, you know, for them to decide, okay, this little fragment here, it's already lost the rest of it, but it, be it doesn't belong to anything else. It's its own document in itself. So this is one of those, the 4Q503, so meaning in this cave they found at least 503. This is the 503rd document that is an independent document that they found there. And they titled it, the scholars have titled it. They said, well, this is talking about daily prayers. So let's call it daily prayers. <laughs> now watch what, it, what one of the scholars uh, say about this. He says, 4Q503 contains a fragmentary collection of morning and evening prayers. The prayers are in the form of blessings. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Sounds familiar? <laughs> uh, to be said in the evening, which is the start of each new day, and at the rising of the sun each morning. The blessings are, for the most part, very formulaic. It's a formula. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and you fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what we have. Now, they're very formulaic and follow precisely fixed models which recur throughout the collection, throughout the document. The blessings are clearly intended for corporate worship rather than personal devotional practice. Mm -hmm. So for the set times of prayer when everybody will gather together and pray together corporately. So they will do it with these said prayers. Let's, and we're talking about the people of Qumran, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls. This is, again, way before Yeshua. You, we, we, we see the development of Jewish liturgy. How, you know, the first one we see with Benzira, there are some ideas that perhaps through the time found, became fixed prayers, became the Amidah that we have today. So that if you had, let's say, that you attended a meeting, a prayer meeting with the Qumran community, you took a tour of Israel, and you found the Qumran community, you attended their prayer meeting, and on their PowerPoint, <laughs> they had this document, the 4Q503, <laughs> daily prayers. <laughs> And they had it out there, up there, and you prayed just like what we do. 
What, what are we trying to say? That the liturgy that we have is very ancient. And it is rooted in scripture. Now, the, the, this prayer, this Qumran prayer, is very important because even though they had a temple, they, they, they lived during the second temple times, before Yeshua, but it was still second temple. It was already second temple. Um, they, lived bef they lived after the Maccabees, just to give you a, a sense of time. Okay? The, the Dead Sea Scroll people, they lived after the Maccabees, before Yeshua. So, a hundred give and take years before. So, what's important about their prayers is that they had a problem with the authorities in the temple, and they withdrew from, they were all priests, they were all Kohen, Kohenim, or Levites. They had a problem with the authority, they couldn't worship at the temple out of conscience. They, they, for them, they were running in the wrong way, so they withdrew and they would go down to the desert, which is not a long trip in Israel. It's not like they were secluded in you know, some distant land. No, you could get to Qumran in a day just walking from Jerusalem, really. And so they will go there, and they live there, they set up their community, uh, and you can go there, you can see the remains of their community. Uh, but they were, they were conducting these prayers in place of the worship in the temple. So again, the importance of this is that later on, Jewish people would not have a temple. And so we see in these prayers a precedent for developing worship, a worship community life without a temple. That's the importance of this. How it, it, it demonstrates the teachings of Hosea and David. That God wants the fruit of lips that bless his name. Praying at the appointed times every day. Now, the, er, the early prayer themes and the structure of the second temple developed into um, practices that we, that we find in the Mishnah. Uh, the Mishnah was written 200 years after, or, or in the, around the year 200. So the temple was destroyed in the year 70, so we're talking about 130 years after the temple was destroyed that the Mishnah was written. But obviously, the material that we find in the Mishnah looks back even to the time before Yeshua. So this is a compilation of Jewish tradition for all of those years. And we find there further development. We find there uh, how the prayers are now really, really being said. You know, for instance, we find the the Seder for the Passover and how you're supposed to do it and, and step by step. Well, that's what we do today. And so we see there the development of, of the liturgy. Now, the Talmud is written around the year 600. Okay, so you can, you, you, you see the historical development we started with Benzira. This is the earliest that we can find. Around uh, about 200 years before Yeshua. Then you see the people in Qumran 100 years before Yeshua. Then you see the Mishnah 130 years after Yeshua, 150 years after Yeshua. And then now you see the Talmud in the year 600. Uh, Let's read the, the final quote that we have here. This is another scholar that writes, another Jewish scholar that writes, the first formal Jewish prayer book, just like what we have, the prayer books that we have, the, 
the Sidurs that we have, it began here with the, in this quote, in this, with these people that we're going to read about here. It says, the first formal Jewish prayer book, the Seder Rav Amran Gaon. That was the title of it because he was the guy who wrote it. Look at the date, 875. That was the first development of the putting together everything in one Sidur. That's, excuse me, that's after uh, after Kamadera. Yeshua. Yes. Mm -hmm. It says that it began as a response from the Babylonian Gaon Rav Amran, the leader of the Jewish community in Babylon, to a Spanish Jewish community. Uh, their request that, the, that he detail the order of prayers for the entire year. So what you have is, this is the year before the year 900, uh, uh, a Sephardic community in Spain, they write to this leader, Jewish leader in Babylon and say, can you fax us a, uh, uh, an, a prayer book that will detail the prayers for the whole year? You know, we want it for all for, for Passover, for Shavuot, uh, include all the fall festivals, and um, oh, and all, also the prayer. You know, what are we supposed to pray every day? So what this guy basically did in Babylon, he just turned around to history and said, "Well, this is what we have in the Talmuds. This is what we have in the Mishnah. These are all the prayers. This is what we pray every day." This is, so he puts together, you know, what we have: the Shema, the Amidah. Uh, the Aleinu, the, all of these prayers, that's the beginning of the Sidur. And so it says, most subsequent, subsequent, easy for me to say, subsequent, subsequent, sequent. I told you I'm from the South. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Prayer books, especially in Europe, echo its organization and instruction. Meaning, the Sidurs we have today, they look just the same as those in the year 875. <laughs> That's great. Now, such books are usually called a Sidur or Maxor. Maxor, we call it the ones that have the holiday rituals in it, the holiday prayers in it. That's the history of, of Jewish liturgy. And more important, that's the theology, that's the biblical roots. To sum it up, the biblical roots is that you can bring the sacrifice of worship and prayer and praise in the place of animal sacrifice. And that is the way to worship. Now, you can't live without, you can't leave without this one. The Torah gives Israel the responsibility to bring these sacrifices every day. In the absence of temple, then it falls on the authorities, on Jewish authorities, rabbis, to develop a way for Israel still to bring the sacrifice of prayer and praise. Messianic Jews are not exempt from this mandate the Torah responsibility to offer prayer and praise to the true and living God as Israel. And as a community that, that attempts to preserve Jewish, a Jewish expression in the body of Messiah, we must embrace this responsibility as a community. Which means 
we must embrace it as, as individuals. When I pray, I see myself as part of Israel fulfilling this service to God. That, that there will be praise and prayer lifted up to him. Incense daily. Going up to his presence to serve him as the true and living God. As he has asked us to do in the Torah. As a covenant responsibility. That is the reason why liturgy fulfills the requirement of Torah. The requirement of bringing sacrifice. There is a direct correlation between living as faithful Jews and, and as a community worshiping through liturgy. It is the expression of the requirement of Torah to offer sacrifices to him daily and offering incense to him that there will be incense burning always in his house. The liturgy fulfills that. And specifically, the Amidah fulfills that because it's a prayer composed as Israel. If you read the entire Amidah, not just what we do on Shabbat, it's just a portion of it. But if you find a Siddur and you read the entire Amidah for the weekdays, you see that it's all about praying inter it's intercession for Israel. That's what it is. It's intercession for Israel. Corporate prayers. As a dedication, as a daily dedication to him just as he required in the Torah. The liturgy has a direct connection with living a Jewish life as, a, as believers in Yeshua. That is why we say so much liturgy and we say so much Hebrew liturgy. Because we live, we, 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 our vision is to preserve a Jewish expression in the body of Messiah. At home, in the Jewish world. So this, this teaching is an, equip, is an equipping for us to know at a deeper level why we do what we do. Amen. And not only to know it and to practice it, but to love it. Amen. To love it. Amen. Amen. Amen.